Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. Welcome to the podcast for the American Monetary Association. This is your host, Jason Hartman, and this is a service of my private foundation, the Jason Hartman Foundation. Today, we have a great interview for you, so I think you'll enjoy it and comment on our website or our blog post. We have a lot of resources there for you, and you can find that at AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org. That's AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org, or the website for the foundation, which is JasonHartmanFoundation.org. Thanks so much for listening, and please visit our website and enjoy our extensive blog and other resources there. It is my great pleasure to have the NIA on the phone today for an interview with us. And we have Daniel N. Girard, and NIA stands for the National Inflation Association. I have been following their work for a while now. They produce some fantastic videos and a new documentary entitled Melt Up. And these guys have some really interesting insights into what is going on and and really the scam that is being played. I'll call it that. That's not their words. It's mine. At the highest levels of our financial system and how we can all best deal with it. Welcome, guys. It's great to have you. Hey, it's our pleasure. Thank you for having us. My pleasure. Gerard, maybe I'll start with you and just get a little background as to what NIA is and and why you started it. Basically, NIA is the National Inflation Association, and it's an organization that we created basically because we were tired of all the propaganda that was being put out by the mainstream media. We felt that there wasn't enough places for the people to go and get the facts about the economy and and why they should be preparing for hyperinflation and we're basically dedicated to preparing Americans for that hyperinflation and, and helping them not only survive but prosper from it. Excellent. Well, that is, that is a very noble mission, and I'm right with you there. So, Daniel, what are your predictions for the future? I mean, obviously you guys believe there will be a hyperinflationary future, and what does that look like? Well, you know, we're looking at literally a, a, a depression in the United States, but it's going to be combined with inflation because we have all the statistics looking at baby boomer data, looking at peak spending for consumers. All of this is pointing towards a huge contraction in not only spending, but revenues for the government. But at the same point in time, we also will have the same projections for a huge increase in spending. So at the same time, they're decreasing their revenue and taxes, as well as the local stores are decreasing their revenues and contracting and closing stores, we're going to be matching everything that closes, every, everything that you look at would be vanishing in, in a depression-like situation. They're going to be replacing it with more debt, with more printing of money, because they don't have a choice, because they have an aging baby boomer generation that is, yes, they're going to be spending less in their older years, but the way our entitlement system is built, we are going to be spending even more on entitlements. For example... During the 90s, we had roughly 500,000 people a year enrolling on Social Security. And basically from this day forward, it's going to be roughly between 1.5 million to 2 million a year. So as you can see, the situation, the storm we're going into is not only a depression here in the United States, but it is a highly inflationary situation where the government has forced inflationary policies. I would agree with you. The thing is that if we parse up what you just said, it's kind of interesting because a lot of the stuff you said would really make one think potentially that we have a deflationary future. I mean, think about it. If we have a contraction in the economy, if we have store closings, all of that adds up to just sort of a a smaller economy with less demand, higher, less capacity utilization. And that would indicate deflation on one hand. Why do you say we'll have inflation, though? I mean, certainly money printing is inflationary. Well, the biggest difference is this will be the first downturn, global downturn in world history, where there is not one single currency that is connected to a precious metal, not connected to gold, not connected to silver, not connected to any commodity. So when you look at you know economics 101, yes, it spells deflation, but you have to remember it. all the books in, in history have a currency that is backed by gold. So when you look at the Great Depression, we still had a currency that was backed by gold. Right. So trying to compare the Great Depression in the 30s and the Great Depression from 2010 to the early 20s, it's really comparing apples to watermelons because 
this time you have to look at the currency situation. It dramatically changes everything. That's a very, very good point. I mean, every currency in the world is now a fiat currency, and so there we really get to this sort of race to the bottom phenomenon, where all of them will potentially become worth their intrinsic value, paper and ink. But maybe the U.S. is is the better of the lousy currencies. I mean, we're certainly seeing that right now with what's going on in Europe, where the euro once thought to be the sort of star of the show、uh, just a couple of years ago is now looking like a real disaster, huh? Yeah, exactly, and it's very deceiving because people will follow the dollar index. What it is is it's, it's, it's illusions priced against other illusions, and that's why the National Inflation Association, part of their 2010 predictions list, was really to have people start focusing on the Dow priced in gold. And as you can see, the Dow and most things relative to gold are actually seeing. Uh, a contraction in their price relative to gold. So, if you look at the Dow Jones, it was roughly, I think, roughly over 40 ounces of gold in 2000. Today, it's just hovering right around, oh, just over seven and a half, just under eight and a half, kind of bouncing around there. But so, if you look at the Dow Jones, I mean, you're not really gaining any value. All you're doing is you're seeing the result of inflation, and of course. This is what the documentary、um, Melt Up shows with overwhelming evidence. Yeah, and by the way, you guys did a fantastic job on、uh, Melt Up. I, I really got to say, I'm impressed. And you had over half a million views of that, right? Yeah, just three weeks. Fantastic, Gerard. That's that's really good work. We look at this sixty plus trillion dollar time bomb of entitlement liability hanging over our heads. This has never happened before in world history. We have aging baby boomers. We have Gen X, my generation, that is much smaller coming behind them, and then Gen Y coming up after that. And yet, at the same time, we have a Reasonable sized chorus of people out there saying that the future is deflationary. I don't agree with them, but I just like you to address what they say. And here's what I hear them say. I hear them say things like, "There is so much deleveraging going on, and so much more deleveraging to come." They quote numbers like forty-six trillion dollars in in potential defaults coming up on on various forms of debt, and they say things like, "The government can't print enough money to create inflation." Well. That, to me, on its face, is a is a completely stupid statement because the fact is there is no limit to the amount of money that can be created out of thin air. But what do you say to the deflationists out there? They are out there, and they say that everybody's talking about inflation, but they say the future is deflationary. And the first part of this downturn really was deflationary in many categories, wasn't it? What you're looking at is the perceived value of a currency. And so right now, when things are kind of normal, the system is still,、um, you could say, relatively intact, although it's being held together with simply nothing but print more money. It is the perceived value of the currency. And that is the biggest difference between the deflationists and the inflationists. Because if you listen to basically our arguments, we're reviewing, we're looking at the same facts, we're looking at the same statistics, and we pretty much agree all the way up until basically what is going to be the short-term result. Even if you if you talk to some of the biggest deflationists,、um, even Harry Dan out there and and、uh, Prechter, they will tell you that yes, they believe in deflation. Of course, they're they're huge on deflation, but they also say. Well, in about ten years, though, we will experience huge hyperinflation. So, the timing is really different. I think both camps do inevitably believe that it, it is a, going to be a dollar situation, and so really that's what separates us. But just getting back to the currency, the dollar is is really you know if, if you keep interest rates low and keep the quantitative easing, you're going to experience. The results of hyperinflation because you are already doing it. If you raise interest rates, like everybody says, it's just going to be so easy to do. I mean, let's be real. What would happen to the U.S. economy if interest rates went up five percent? I mean, we can barely sell homes by giving people eight thousand dollar tax credits and having interest rates for the banks at zero percent. If you raise interest rates, this economy will freeze up. And as it freezes up, just like the world is turning its back on Greece, they will look at the U.S. dollar as no longer a stable currency because the U.S. dollar is still backed by the U.S. economy and the perception that we can grow ourselves out of this. Once they see it freeze up because we raise the interest rates two percent, three percent, five percent, the world will know. They'll know that the United States is either going to have to 
print to devalue their currency to pay off their debts, or they're going to have to default. Either way, it, it equals people running from the U.S. currency, and investor demand for treasuries will collapse it's already contracting. There's already some of our biggest treasury buyers are already contracting in their in their holdings. So we're already seeing the world look at the dollar not like they have ever uh, in the last 30 years. Right, and what those treasury auctions directly relate to mortgage rates, and that is why I agree that we must is absolutely impossible that we will not see higher mortgage interest rates in the future. We we must see higher rates. There's no other way. Because there's they no can't doubt that we might see more mortgage defaults in the future and more forced liquidations around Wall Street, but that's not going to change the fact that the dollar would not be looked at as a safe haven and that people need to position themselves into gold and silver, which are the only things that will provide protection from both a deteriorating economy and massive inflation. So, uh, yeah, very good point. So what's odd is I've had Harry Dent and Bob Prechter on my show before, and oddly enough... Bob Prechter is a very interesting guy, and, and so is Harry Dent, of course. He still kind of believes in the metals, it seems like. I mean, even though he's a deflationist, and he's got that, that big report he wrote on coping with deflation. It's sort of contradictory, if you ask me. And then Harry Dent said something that I just don't understand at all. He's, he talks about the fact that young people are deflationary when they enter the economy. And he's referring to Gen Y, 80 million Gen Yers entering the economy and creating more innovation and that being deflationary, well, I I guess it is from a technology standpoint, but food and energy and commodities are are what we all really live on, not iPhones, although they're super cool, right? I I just don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, well, what he's basically reviewing is, is the fact that young people pay less in taxes and they make less money. People peak in income around 50 years old. They're peaking and spending around 46 to 48 because they've got these teenagers in the house eating everything. They've got to buy car insurance. They're paying for school loans. So I think that's what he's probably looking at. But, see, we look at that and we put the math together and go, wow, we're going to have less income and uh, more entitlement spending, more spending. The the spending doesn't contract. It doesn't matter. If you look at uh, Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter who's in the House, who's in the Senate, who's in the White House. We know one thing about this government. They spend, and if they don't have the money, they have no hesitation to borrow it. So we know the result of borrowing and the result of printing is Economics 101, which is hyperinflationary. Yeah, no question about it. What do you consider hyperinflationary? Is there a percentage number? Does that mean 20%, 50% per year? Does it mean Zimbabwe 10 zillion percent per year? Uh, What does that mean? Basically, when you're looking at hyperinflation, by definition, we are already in a situation where we are hyperinflating our currency. When you look at the M3, how it shot up over the last two years, you know, people talk about, oh, the M3 is down. Well, you know, well, they stopped it's reporting down from it. the moon, yeah. but, uh, you know, it's still really high. It's, you know, the Federal Reserve is, has so many bad assets, uh, has increased its books in the trillions. Uh, look at the U.S. I mean, it took 40 presidents to hit a trillion dollars of national debt. We just did a trillion in the last seven months. <laughs> it's amazing. So if you want to talk about hyperinflation, by definition, we are already hyperinflating our currency. We are just waiting for the result. As far as what kind of percentage are we going to see in prices, that's hard to say. For sure, in terms of dollars, uh, I think you're going to see double and certainly in need items you know, in the triple digits of price increases. We already believe that the real rate of U.S. inflation is already around to be 5 to 6 percent. There's no doubt that uh, we're in a hyperinflationary period. It's just that we're waiting for the results of that to be, you know, price inflation. So what has to happen for this hyperinflation to occur? By the academic definition that Daniel was talking about, which is just really money creation, we're already there. But people haven't really noticed it yet. And I kind of like to say that we have inflation already and everything that really matters and everything that's optional, we have deflation. But is it just a matter of that money trickling down from Wall Street and the banks Are they just sort of hoarding that money and it hasn't hit the streets yet, if you will? What has to happen for people to really notice this in their daily life? Well, the average American is already noticing because they're paying at the pump food prices. This is a statistic that's a month old now, but they were up 27% year to year. When you combine food and energy up roughly 17% year to year. So the average person is already filling this. And uh, the food stamp... 
I can interrupt you one second, Dan. I mean, even food stamp usage right now is at an all-time high, over 40 million. People are definitely seeing it. 40 million people on food stamps? Yeah, it's at an all-time high. I think it just topped 40 million. I think it's 40.2 million. You know, the nanny state is here, isn't it? We are we are living in a socialist country. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's like everywhere you look, the government is shelling out money it doesn't have to buy votes. It's just amazing to me. Incredible. You know, I, I was at the grocery store today and uh, with my wife, and, you know, I don't know if anybody else has noticed, uh, but I, I sure did. You know, when you look at, like, uh, the dryer's ice cream, they are smaller than they are they were last year very good but point the same price yeah. another form of inflation just shrink the size keep the price the yeah, same absolutely yeah. that's a big thing and you see it going on with frito-lay here in southern california there's no more 24 packs of soda now it's 20 packs of soda but still the same price so there's a lot of shadow inflation out there as well yeah, that's a very good point. I know a lot of people don't really notice that uh, packages are shrinking all over. I was out at dinner last night and I ordered a drink and I commented to the person I was with. I said, hey, this martini glass is actually smaller than it used to be. And I, I remember thinking before this restaurant has very big, generous glasses and the glasses are getting smaller. So you're, you're absolutely right. No question about it. Talk a little bit more, if you would, about the Dow Gold ratio, because I think that is a very significant measuring stick. Gold is a, a reliable measuring stick. And the old joke is 2000 years ago, you could have purchased a, a, a toga and a pair of sandals with one ounce of gold. And today you can buy a, a man's suit and a pair of shoes. And it's pretty darn consistent. And when you talk about the Dow Gold ratio, Peter Schiff, about two years years ago, had a very interesting interview, very telling on CNBC with Mark Haynes, and he said that there has been no real appreciation in the value of the Dow since 1929. The returns have been dividends, that's it. Then he had this guy from B of A on, and you may, you're probably familiar with this video, it's floating around, and he's trying to argue that the power of a processor has increased, and all of that hedonic scams that they use to to measure inflation and, and lie to us about it. But what else do people need to know about the Dow Gold Ratio? Talk to us a little bit more about that, because I think that is a very, very interesting metric that everybody should be looking at. During gold's last bull market, we saw gold rise to from $35 to over $850 for over a 2,000% gain. And from gold's low in 2001 of about two. That thing was about $255 per ounce. Um, we saw the same percentage game in that bull market to send it to over $6,000 per ounce back in 2001. Um, the only way to look at it is with the Dow, you know, the Dow Jones and gold ratio, which at, in 1980 had bottomed at one, meaning that the price of gold matched the Dow Jones. If we saw gold and the Dow Jones meet the medium current levels, we could see uh, it rise to over $5,000 per ounce today. That's an incredible. We're in this huge mess of entitlement liability, and I've identified six ways that the government might get itself out of the mess, and I'd just like to run them by you guys and see what you think, if I may. The first one is that they could just default on the promises. This, of course, is way too harsh. It's politically unpopular. I don't think this is going to happen, but it may to a small extent where they just say, hey, we can't pay the Medicare, we can't pay the Social Security, etc. Again, harsh, unpopular, unlikely. Number two, raise taxes. Of course, they can't raise taxes enough to pay for this liability. They're in, it's so underwater, it's it's just not possible. But I think it'll be somewhat of a blend of all six of these things. Number three is have a yard sale, sell off assets to raise money. A few years ago, we thought about selling the ports to du Dubai. That was a big political football. The BLM sells off land. Now I guess we're considering selling military equipment to Muammar Gaddafi, our former enemy. Foreign countries own toll roads and so forth in, in, in the U.S. Number four the American military or the economic hitman. I had John Perkins on the show. I'm sure you know who he is. Really interesting guy. Just steal from other countries, steal their assets, their commodities. Number five would be good news, and that would be innovation, especially in the area of technology, energy, biotech, nanotech. That would be good news. But number six, and most likely, and I think this is what you guys really agree with, is just simply inflate their way out of the debt. Huge inflation. They'll keep the promises in nominal dollars. Well, in real dollars, Everybody just gets poorer and poorer, and our debtor countries, China namely, will get paid back in more and more worthless dollars. Any thoughts on those six ways out of the mess? Looking at the list you just provided, you know, certainly, of course, I agree with you. It's, it's going to be default by devaluation. The government has no problem doing this. I mean, if you look at 
everyone runs around talking about our standard of living, how well it's, you know, it is compared to 20 years ago. Look, because of the results of all the money creation, all the borrowing, uh, you know, the borrowing from the future, the borrow, borrowed prosperity, here you have, it, it now takes two people to raise a family. It takes a credit card. It takes a home equity of credit. You know, I just talked to a couple a few days ago, and they told me how they were debt-free now because they had lumped every credit card and loan they have into their house. Okay, so people don't even understand the concept of really being debt-free anymore because they're just so used to this lifestyle. Twenty years ago, it took a grocery clerk to raise a family of three or four, and now it takes two people working full-time jobs. So the standard of living has deteriorated. Um, when you look at seniors, they're absolutely being ripped off because as bad as it seems when you look at the debt for Social Security and the obligation for Social Security, it would be even worse if we just calculated inflation the same way we did 25, 30 years ago. According to John Williams from Shadow Stats, right now we're underpaying our senior citizens 43% because of all the different gimmicks that you'll see in melt-up that we do with inflation, how we calculate the CPI, which is how we give them their standard of living increase. So if you watch the movie Melt Up, for those of you who've already seen it, you'll know that we're, we're no longer measuring the cost of living. We're measuring the cost of survival. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, and you are so right about that, because with substitution and waiting and hedonics, and then just out and out stripping things out of the index, it's completely bogus, and the government has a huge incentive for misleading the public, number one, to buy votes and make them think they're having a better life than they really are, but number two is, all of the entitlements are indexed to the, the CPI, which is controlled by the government. So there's a huge motivation to mislead when it comes to this, no question about it. What do you think people should do? I mean, really, what is the strategy of NIA? And namely, what sectors do you think will see this hyperinflation? And this is in a good way for the investor. Obviously, you guys like precious metals, I think, right? Absolutely. Are there any other areas where you see big opportunity for investment? Just so you know, we, uh, we released a review on our website, a gold and silver bullion review for those people who do want to invest into the gold or, or silver. Many websites out there, they actually sell the bullion right online. We've reviewed many of them, and um, you can v visit our website for those reviews. But we've made uh, the best investment of the next decade to be silver. We believe silver actually has more upside than gold. Um, it's, it's, in history, it's always outperformed gold, and it's actually a lot cheaper than gold right now. A lot of people... We get a lot of questions and, and emails from our members that say, you know, it's hard for them when the gold's, you know, a thousand, two hundred dollars an ounce. But you can actually invest into silver, and it's, you know, below twenty dollars an ounce still right now. And we feel there's there's a lot of upside potential there. But uh, other than silver and gold, we do believe that agriculture, as you know, as we've seen uh, food inflation, we believe agriculture is going to continue to to rise, and we're very bullish in agriculture, as well as oil. We're getting ready to release our next stock suggestion, which will be an oil play. It's our first oil play, and we do believe oil has a lot of upside, um, especially to take advantage of the recent BP oil spill. Again, if you sign up to our newsletter, we consistently put out different suggestions in different companies. Not only do we suggest to invest into the bullion itself, but we also suggest to play the miners and the companies out there that are actually producing um, the gold and producing the silver and farming, and these are the companies that we believe actually even have more upside based on the market. So again, sign up to the newsletter, and, and you can go to the website and see many of the stock suggestions that we've had. You know, almost all our stock suggestions have been up since our since we've released our, our website. So. Um, definitely check it out. Excellent. And you know, I'd have to say that as far as the metals go, and I'm not as much of a metals bug as, as you guys are, but as far as they go, I think you're absolutely right that silver is the play because traditionally that silver gold ratio, I think has been about 17 to one and it's currently 68 to one. So if that tradition holds or even comes anywhere near where it used to be, silver has a big upside. Absolutely agree with you there. The uh, American silver eagles that have been sold or is also at an all-time high right now. In in terms of the the uh, number being sold, you mean? Yes, the yeah. amount of purchases, yeah. Right, yeah. So there's not a lot of supply out there, you know, with 
compared to the demand. So there's definitely a lot of different characteristics out there at that point, the silver being a huge investment opportunity right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's and it's truly an industrial metal, whereas gold it really isn't anymore. So I do want to run a couple things by you in terms of the metals. Look, at I'm a metals investor, and I agree with you that it's not bad. I just kind of look at metals as, as the way to preserve your wealth. I don't really call them as much of an investment as many other people do, and I'll tell you why, and i just like to run this by you. They don't offer any financing or income or tax benefits, and if you're a little paranoid like I am, <laughs> they're subject to confiscation potentially, and also subject to manipulation by central banks. And I think they're being largely manipulated now. And I I know that you had a video on silver manipulation and you were right about your prediction there. Uh, That was just about a month ago, I believe, which I found interesting. And, you know, I agree that manipulation can never go on forever. But the question is, can it go on longer than any of us can wait? And there's that old joke about the markets, referring to the stock market, the markets are ir- irrational. Well, yeah, you may be right, but the, the market can remain irrational longer than we can remain solvent. <laughs> so I certainly think you probably agree that central banks are manipulating the prices of the metals, right? Yeah, there's no doubt about it. It's to our advantage. I mean, you don't want to buy something that's being manipulated up. You want to buy something that's being manipulated down. So when you buy silver for 18 bucks send a thank you card over to J.P. Morgan because <laughs> yeah. the reason why you can buy it for $18 and not pay north of $100, $200 for an ounce of silver. And as far as the, the, the metals not offering a dividend, specifically um, looking at what we believe, like Gerard said, was you know the investment of the decade, silver. If you're a technology investor or a commodity investor, I mean, silver is where you want to be because silver, let's say you, 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 like, you think cell phones are going to do really well or you think you know, China and Asia are going to industrialize. Well, that's what the play is, right. silver. Silver is in all these different components that we use every day. It's in computers, it's in cell phones, it's, it's a catalyst for medicines, it's in the windows for skyscrapers. So if you believe Asia is going to continue to industrialize, we are using so much silver. And, and really the supply and demand situation is the most bullish factor for silver. If you look at 50 years ago, above ground available silver was 10 billion ounces, we have shrunk that within 50 years down to less than a billion ounces of above ground available silver. That's amazing. It really is. Yeah, so we've already started to see that their silver tighten up, and you know we definitely believe that there, will, there could be a major short squeeze in the near future, and, and that's why we try to expose it in Melt Up, and, and we hope that many people out there see Melt Up and, and uh, can help spread the word. And the more that we expose it, uh, you know, I think the closer we'll become to seeing that squeeze. Yeah, I, I agree with you. This is just such a big scam, and, and so few people are really aware of what is going on with the ultimate weapon against them, and that is the value of their currency. So in what form would you buy silver? Silver eagles? Is that your favorite? Personally, I don't think it matters. I, I, I personally just buy silver bullion or silver mining stocks. So, yeah. But... Uh, one thing I can tell you what not to do is don't get into the collector value. Don't start paying $200 an ounce for a silver right. coin because it was on some ship. You want to buy the metal. Right, the bullion. In the first quarter of 2010, the U.S. Mint has already sold over 9 million American silver eagles, just so you know. Incredible. So there hasn't been much talk about this, but I have read and heard a little bit about it. And that is the possibility that the COMEX exchange is a Ponzi scheme. And I tell you, if if that is true, boy, we are in for a very rude awakening. A lot of people think they're investing in the metals because they own it in a fund, in an ETF. And that's really, to me, just another fiat currency. They're getting a piece of paper for their dollars, and they think it's a piece of metal, yet they're not taking delivery of it. So I, I like your system, which I think boils down to physical delivery and mining stocks. So if you're in the metal, you hold the metal. Have you heard anything about that in in terms of the COMEX? Yes, we have. And that's the main reason why we've said, you know, I I think there will come a time where people will call and and ask for the physical silver and we could see a COMEX default. We definitely suggest, like you said, to buy it yourself, hold on to it yourself. You, You know, many of those companies that sell it are on our website. And we definitely believe in a lot of the miners. Right now, there's a lot of silver miners out there that we are researching that, and, and that we've also suggested that are on our website that are significantly undervalued fundamentally. And, you know, we definitely think there's a, a huge opportunity there. And, again, once that comics default I mean, happens and people call for their actual, actual physical silver, 
we can see one of the biggest short squeezes that the world has ever seen. Yeah, I, I, I tell you, if everybody asks and that run on the bank, if you will, on the COMEX ever occurs and people want to take delivery, I don't think they have all the metal there. I mean, I think that is a very strong possibility that that is true. But again, there's no way for me to personally know. What do you think about the other metals? What do you think about copper, palladium, platinum? Do you guys have any thoughts about that or are you just kind of all around silver? I personally would sound like a broken record because I don't buy the other metals as much because there's every argument you can make for platinum or copper, that same argument is there for silver, only times 100. It's just like the same argument you can make for gold. It's all there in silver, but it's not vice versa. I cannot make all the arguments that I have for silver for gold. I certainly can't make all the arguments I have for silver for copper and platinum. So when it comes to the smaller investor, I believe... Silver is, uh, without a doubt, their best opportunity. Okay, good. What would you like people to know and do? Just kind of summing this whole thing up. I mean, definitely people have got to see the documentary you've created, Melt Up, which is great. I could highly recommend that myself. What else should people know? You know, you know what I want to know? When? <laughs> That's the million-dollar question everybody wants to know. Well, right now, I mean... Um... Everybody really needs to you know, start paying attention and educating themselves, and that's the main reason why we've created NIA, is to help educate people. And people need to get educated. People need to start spreading the word to their friends and family. People need to start watching documentaries like Melt Up, and they really need to start looking at the facts and start following the mainstream me media. So, you know, the first thing is, is basically I, I think people should go to inflation.us. They should sign up. They should sign up to many other publications out there and, and start following people that we that we also believe in, like Ron Paul, and we felt Peter Schiff and Jim Rogers, and obviously we've we had an exclusive inter interview recently with Gerald Salenti, which was great. Had him on the show too. He's great. Yeah. Yeah, he's great, and we you know we suggest te checking out the Trans Institute, and we definitely think that people need to start getting out of the U.S. dollar and, and positioning themselves into gold and silver and things that will preserve their purchasing power. But most importantly, it's. We want people to start getting educated. Very good advice. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us today. Really appreciate it. And I want to just tell you, keep up the good work. Give out the website, if you would. www.inflation.us. Inflation.us. Everybody go check that out. Daniel and Gerard, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you for having us on. The American Monetary Association is a nonprofit venture funded by the Jason Hartman Foundation, which is dedicated to educating people about the practical effects of monetary policy and government actions on inflation, deflation, and personal freedom. Our goal is to help people prosper in the midst of uncertain economic times. This show is produced by the Jason Hartman Foundation, all rights reserved. For publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate professional if you require individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of the Jason Hartman Foundation exclusively.